sin. Thank you. You may be seated. The marvelous, infinite grace of God, grace that is greater than our sin. And as you consider it, if you understand how bad your sin is, you'll begin to get a glimpse of the infinite, infinite, matchless grace of God. Tonight our text is in Acts chapter 16, Divine Direction, part number three. Tonight the message entitled Macedonia, Here I Come. When God gives you his direction, when you know what he wants you to do, are you ready to do it? Are you ready to say, yes, Lord, that is your will, that's clear, you've made it very, very obvious, very evident to me what you want me to do. Now, here I am, send me, like Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 6. Are you ready not merely to know the will of God? Are you ready to do the will of God? If God were to make it clear to you tonight, for example, that you were supposed to leave the comfort of your home here in this northeast corridor somewhere, and that you were supposed to go, say, to South America, and you knew that was the will of God, would you obey? Would you go? Suppose you became convinced through a series of opportunities that came available to you, through a series of provisions that came available to you, through a series of desperate cries that you became aware of, and you had it laid on your heart to go say to the Eskimos of Labrador, would you go? Or would you say, here am I, Lord? The resources that you've just given to me and the call that you've placed on my heart, I'll keep the resources, but give that call to someone else. Are you here tonight to learn about the will of God so that it will be an interesting theological thought that is tucked away someplace in your mind? Or are you here tonight to hear part three of discerning the will of God so that you will be able to not only discern it, but to obey it. Unless you commit to doing whatever God wants you to do, before you find out what God wants you to do, you will probably hesitate. We need to be first completely sold out to Christ Second, we need to be completely sold out to doing what God wants us to do, not what we want to do. And then we must, with passion, seek his clear direction so that we will quit wasting our lives and so that we will obey. Macedonia, here I come. Divine direction, part Three. We're in Acts chapter 16. I'll begin reading in verse 6. Two weeks ago we had Gospel Green Light, Divine Direction Part 2. Last week, of course, was our fifth Sunday special, the Day of Battle DVD from Frontline Mission. Very, very important DVD. I'm sorry for those of you who missed it. Uh, incredible seeing how God is reaching into Muslim countries all across North Africa and using even missionaries from Chile, not just Americans, not just Britishers, not just Australians, not just New Zealanders. He's using people from South America to reach Muslims for Christ, as well as those, of course, from the United States. Some very interesting things we learned last week, and I hope that you will take those to heart. Now, Acts chapter 16, beginning in verse 6. Now, when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, after they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. Very clear prohibition. And they, passing by Mysia, came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, 
assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Our gracious Heavenly Father, now we thank you for your word and for its power. Father, I pray that you will cause not merely this congregation, but this preacher always to be ready to obey your will when you make it known to us. Help us not to hesitate. Help us not to argue. Help us not to try to give you options that we might choose from and then hope that you'll put your stamp of approval on what we choose to do. We pray, Father, that you will take your word tonight and help us as we learn to discern your will that first we must be willing to obey it before you reveal it to us. And so, Father, we thank you so much for your word. We praise you that you have given to us direct communication from your heart so that we might be pleasing to you, the living and true God, the one who has called us by your grace through the blood of your Son and the power of your Holy Spirit and drawn us to him, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for this time. We pray for your blessing upon it, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you know, when we began this study two sessions ago, dealing with the study, we looked at divine direction overview. How to know the will of God when there are not specific scriptures on that particular issue at hand. Here in our text, the question was a missionary question. Shall I go west, east, south, or north? And where shall I stop to preach? The issue is not, shall I preach? The issue was, where shall I preach the gospel? And you and I have been given the gospel, and so wherever we are, we are to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. God didn't change Paul's commission. He merely changed his direction and the target people that he was going to. And the same is true for us. God has given to each one of us here, if you're saved, God has given to each one of us here at least one, and probably more than one, spiritual gift. So it's not a matter of, Lord, should I use my gift? It's, Lord, where and how do you want me to use it? Where are the places and locations that you want me to exercise which you've entrusted to my care? There were 22 spiritual gifts to begin with. Seven of those were temporary gifts related to the reception and proclamation of new special revelation from God, the gift of apostle, prophet, healings, miracles, tongues, interpretation of tongues, and the gift of knowledge. Those are the seven gifts that were revelatory gifts that were given only during the New Testament era when the New Testament was being written. They have ceased, and 1 Corinthians 13 says that they would cease. It didn't say that they would not cease. It was merely a matter of when. And in the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, end of the chapter, it makes it clear that they would cease when the perfect, that is, the completed, the finished, teleos, revelation from God, was finished. And that is finished. Book of Revelation chapter 22, the last few verses make it very clear that revelation from God, new revelation, has ceased. And therefore... The New Testament canon is completed, the New Testament canon is closed, and therefore the special revelatory gifts are no longer being given. But the other 15 are still being given. And you have one or more of those gifts, and it's not a question of should you use it, it's a question of where can you use it, and how many opportunities can you take to use it, and what are all the places that God has given you opportunity to put it into practice. And in this context, it's in the context of this particular body of believers. Because each gift is necessary for the edifying, that is, for the upbuilding of the body of Christ. And so, if you want to know the will of God, you need to make sure that you are exercising the spiritual gifts that God has given you. He never gives you more light than what that light which he has given you already and when you obey it, then he gives you more light. If you refuse to obey it, if you hesitate to obey it, if you are reluctant to obey it, you will not get more light concerning the will of God until you obey what you already know to be his will. And God is gracious in not giving us more light because if he did, we would simply find ourselves under a greater a period of discipline chastening from the Father's hand. If you disobey him on point one, you're going to get spanked for it. But if he gave you point one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten, so that you could see the far end of it, and you didn't obey, you'd be in serious trouble. 
So God in his grace gives us light for one step at a time. And God in his grace gives us light so that we can obey one step at a time. And as we grow, learning to trust him, learning to walk by faith, learning that as we take those steps, he is always there. He is always providing. He is always helping. He is always strengthening. He is always comforting. He is there. He is the God who is there. He causes our faith to grow. Instead of making us overwhelmed with the impossibility of all the things that are yet to come, he gives us one step at a time and expects us to obey. Now we talked about where the Apostle Paul was walking. He'd gone about 300 miles, passing by all those towns on the way, until God made it very clear that Paul was to go over into Macedonia. We saw that God specifically chose certain towns for Paul to uh, stop in because those are towns where they had specific problems that God was going to have Paul write New Testament epistles to so that we as a body of believers now would have the entire scope of the different areas of problems that the church would face. He didn't write, for example, to Troas. He didn't write, for example, to Neapolis. He didn't write to Berea, although those are places that he visited. He didn't write to Athens. He didn't write to Sincrea. He didn't write to the island of Rhodes. He didn't write an epistle to Caesarea. Those were all places that Paul went, but that's not where God had him write his epistles. God gave him other places which he visited so that he might write epistles that comprise our New Testament today to give us a complete and finished revelation of everything that the church would need to know to function perfectly if we would obey in this dispensation of grace in which we find ourselves. Many places that Paul went, only a few of those places where Paul wrote. In studying the way which God gives direction by prohibition and freedom to proceed, we learned some basic ground rules. There were three basic ground rules. Number one, God never gives direction that's contrary to his word. Number two, God never tells a believer to do something that is morally reprehensible. Number three, God never gives direction that is mixture of truth and error. God always gives direction that is truth. In all matters of faith and practice, that is the practical Christian life, the scripture is always the first source to which we turn. But as we noted, Paul is on his second missionary journey, and not all of the scripture had been written. So there were some unique features to the direction that Paul received here. He received a vision. He got a vision of a man from Macedonia, the Holy Spirit, and we're not told exactly how the Holy Spirit did it, but the Holy Spirit prohibited them from going east. The Holy Spirit prohibited them, though they were trying to do that. The Holy Spirit gave them clear direction. They were to bypass certain towns. And we talked about how God, in his mercy and grace, because he does not owe man anything, passes by some. That should cause us to shiver. It is the miracle and grace of God that we heard the gospel. It is the miracle and grace of God that God opened our hearts to respond to the gospel. It is the miracle and grace of God that the Holy Spirit came in and regenerated us through faith in Christ because God passed by many. Are you thankful? Do you fall down before him to worship in humility and say, Lord, I did not deserve this, but oh, I am grateful because you have shown mercy to me, a sinner. The grace of God. Now Paul had the gift of knowledge. Paul had the gift of prophet. Those are two of the revelatory gifts that we spoke about just a moment ago. And that's why he gets a revelation here. Scripture is completed. You're not going to get a vision which gives you the direction of God. Satan still is in the business of giving visions. Drunks still see visions. People who are extremely emotionally agitated see visions. But God is no longer giving visions like we find in the New Testament. Because scripture is finished. 
and you will find your direction by studying and obeying the clearly revealed will of God that he has given in the word of God and then he will through that lead you into areas whereby he has established principles and as you test the different options that you find you will discover that one or more of those will be a violation of some principle that God has given to you and you can immediately eliminate those and then suppose you have two or three options left as you begin to study the Word of God more closely you will begin to discern that one or more of those perhaps is a difference between what God required of Israel in the Old Testament and believers in the New Testament we'll be talking about that more in detail in just a moment and then you will finally come to the conclusion even though it may cause you to tremble even though it may be a fearful option that there is only one option that is clearly the will of God for your life most of us don't like to go that far we'd rather sort of let it just sort of fade off into fuzziness out there and keep on going on our carnal way than really pursuing what we know might be the will of God because it's scary we never need to be afraid Paul tells young Timothy God hath not given us the spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind what God reveals as his will will never be insanity what God reveals in his will will always have God's provision what God reveals as his will for your life will always have God's empowerment so that you can obey it with joy those are basic ground rules folks unless you keep your eyes focused on that and the fact that God does have a perfect will for your life by which you can gain the maximum amount of eternal heavenly rewards and be most pleasing to your Savior you know there's only one route that direction if you want to maximize the potential that God has given you and if you want to please him to the uttermost make a hundred percent on your test not just make a passing score of say 60 you know 59 is failing and 60 is a D minus if you want to be in the center of his will if you want to know his will you will move forward even when it's scary all right the will of God we looked and we saw that there are 23 verses in the Bible where that phrase the will of God occurs that's a logical place so we began our study at that point and remember that God always wants you to know his will more than you want to know his will God's not hiding his will God has revealed his will he's given you an entire Bible so that you will know his will it's our obligation our responsibility to read this to study it to meditate on it to compare scripture with scripture we're going to learn how to do some of that tonight I've already taught you how to do inductive Bible study now tonight we're going to learn something else that I hope you will take to heart and begin to do if you have not already done it it's something that I've been doing ever since I was a preteen and it's something that I have found to be incredibly beneficial and yes scripture memory is part of that but I'm going to teach you another practical means tonight you've got to memorize scripture if you want to meditate on scripture you cannot meditate on scripture in the middle of the night when God wakes you up if in fact you don't have it memorized because most of us sort of lie there in bed and it's dark and you can't read in the dark and most of us wouldn't pick up our Bibles and read it in the middle of the night but if you have it memorized you can meditate on it we're gonna learn something else tonight the Lord willing but what have we learned what are the general areas the broad categories that we've identified where God has revealed his will those broad categories include I'll just list them obedience service plans the divine unity that we can see and must reflect in the Trinity life transformation that was the business of presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice the will of God is to bear the fruit of the Spirit we saw many places in the New Testament where the will of God relates to the exercising of our spiritual gifts and I spent a moment on that just a few minutes ago 
the spiritual gifts. It applies to all the spiritual gifts, not just to the leadership gifts, although Paul applies it at least five different times to the leadership gifts that God gave to him. We find it's related to all of the leadership gifts. It's the will of God. It is the will of God. It says so in 1 Corinthians 12, that you personally exercise your gifts properly. If you're not exercising your gifts in a biblical manner, you are not in the center of the will of God. It's as simple as that. If you are not exercising your gifts in a biblical manner, you are not in the center of the will of God. Because God gave you your gifts to edify the body of Christ. And if you have the gift of evangelist, you have the responsibility of going out and leading others to Christ and bringing them to church or building them into a Bible preaching church. What we call missionaries, almost all have the gift of evangelists. They're leading people to Christ and establishing local churches. Gift of evangelists is not giving pep talks in churches and taking offerings. The gift of evangelists is leading people to Christ and then building them into Bible preaching churches and seeing biblical leadership raised up and ordaining that biblical leadership and then moving on to another place. Other broad categories that we identified where God has revealed his will include service to other Christians, separation from sin and from the world. The will of God deals with our motivations, not with eye services, men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. That's motivation. We saw the will of God related to the focus of our prayer life. We saw the will of God relates to sanctification and moral purity. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. We saw that the will of God relates to having a life filled with thanksgiving. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. We saw the will of God relates to patience, promise, and the will of God in Hebrews 10.36. For you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. And you know how you get patience. Don't pray for patience unless you want trouble. Tribulation worketh patience, the Bible says so. That's the way God develops patience in our life. The ability to put up with the difficult circumstances. Long-suffering deals with putting up with difficult people. Patience deals with putting up with difficult circumstances of life. We saw that the will of God relates to our lifestyle testimony to others. For so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. We saw a great deal of text dealing with suffering and the will of God. Suffering sometimes is part of the will of God for your life. That's tough. We don't like that. There are members of this congregation that are right now going through suffering. And they're having a rough time with it. But they have admitted, to me at least, that they know this is the will of God and that God is doing something in their lives. Suffering and the will of God. God does that so that we would no longer live the rest of our time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. 1 Peter 4, 2. Permanency in the will of God. The world passes away the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now tonight... We're going to pick up another phrase. The two little words, his will, as that refers to God. Let's learn something more about God's will as we look at the different passages, both in Old Testament and New Testament, where we find his will. The first thing we discover is that the will of God is sovereign. The will of God is sovereign. Daniel chapter 4, verse 35. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? The will of God is sovereign. The second thing that we learn is... The will of God, doing the will of God, gives you doctrinal understanding. When you obey the will of God, you will get doctrinal understanding. Listen to John chapter 7, verse 17. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, 
whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. That's Jesus talking. Are you willing to do his will? Then you will understand the doctrine, the teaching, the deep things of scripture. If you only want to just sort of dabble in the will of God, all you're ever going to understand is the surface stuff. You'll never get below the surface. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. We find something else rather interesting when we get over to chapter 9. It's a man born blind. He's answering the questions that the scribes and the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, are putting to him. They don't like Jesus. They're trying to figure out some way that they can deny the miracle that has just been done. And they begin to mock the man and say, you know, we know that this man is a sinner. Give glory to God. Don't, don't give glory to Jesus. You know, give glory to God. This man's got to be a sinner. And he has a rather wry sense of humor, and he doesn't really care what they say about him or what they do about him. But listen to what he says here in verse 31. Now we know that God heareth not sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. That man, a beggar who had sat blind for all those years, more than 40 years, suddenly had more theological insight than all those guys who had gone to rabbinic seminary and who were all top dogs in the system. He makes the obvious conclusions. Oh, he comes farther than that because God continues to give him more light until finally he worships Jesus. But he knows at least that much. He knows if you do God's will, God listens to you. How about Acts chapter 22, verse 14? And he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest do, to know, that thou shouldest know his will, and see that just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. Why did God choose you? Now folks, Presbyterians, ever since Presbyterianism got started, believe that God chose some, they're called the elect. We have in this verse one of the reasons why God chose some. Do you believe that you are among the elect? Do you believe that God chose you? If you're saved, God chose you. You didn't choose God because you were dead in trespasses and sins and dead men do not choose anything except death. Why did God choose you? The verse tells us, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee that thou shouldest know his will and see that just one and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. Do you know his will? Have you seen Christ in the scriptures? Have you heard his word to you? And what have you done with it? As we get over to Romans chapter 2, we find Paul giving some indictments. He's telling the people, you think you're so good. You think you know it all. Now what are you doing with it? Romans 2.18 And knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. and yet you have violated it. That's what the rest of the chapter deals with. You know his will, you have been instructed. Many of you have sat in church for 50, 60, 70 years, maybe some longer. 
What have you done with what you have learned? Read Romans chapter 1, 2, and 3 in light of that. Romans chapter 9. We're back to the sovereignty of God here in Romans chapter 9, 9, 10, and 11. deals with the sovereignty of God, and you've heard me preaching out of Romans 9, 10, and 11 on Sunday mornings as it relates to Israel, and Israel being an example for us as to how God deals with his people. And Romans 9, 10, and 11 deal with election, and they deal with the sovereignty of God, and they deal with predestination. They deal with all the big heavy doctrines. They deal with Pharaoh and how God chose Pharaoh to smash Pharaoh. How God hardened Pharaoh so that he could manifest his own glory. It's the sovereignty of God. Romans 9.19 Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? And Paul goes on and says, David, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed to say to him that formed it, Why have you made me thus? Is the potter is the pot going to say to the potter, Why did you make me this way? No, we don't have that right. When you try to act like that, God smites you. Who has resisted his will? No one has resisted his will. So it's better to be on the right side of his will than on the wrong side of his will. How about Ephesians chapter 1 verse 5? Another verse that Arminians don't like. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. You know, part of knowing and doing the will of God is submitting to the fact that his will controls. It's according to the good pleasure of his will. God is not sitting in heaven, biting his fingernails, wondering whether or not his will will ultimately be accomplished. Whether you obey him or don't obey him, his will will still be done. And he will still drag you kicking and screaming as he did with Jonah to accomplish his will. But you will be covered with all kinds of acid spots all over, as Jonah probably was from the acid in the belly of the great whale, or the great fish. You will probably be covered with fish vomit as you are spit up on the shore. And you will still have to do what God has told you to do. Would it not have been more pleasant for Jonah to simply have trusted God, to walk by faith, to get rid of the hate and the bitterness that was in his heart against the Ninevites? And then when he got there and preached and had revival, he sat in the, in the sun and pouted, and then a gourd grew up that God prepared specifically. And he was very thankful for that because it brought him personal comfort, personal peace. And God prepared a worm, and the worm smote the gourd, and it died overnight. And then Jonah got mad because he was getting fried in the sun because God prepared a strong east wind, and it came and blasted Jonah. And Jonah wanted to die. And God came to him and said, Look, Jonah, won't you ever get it right? Don't you understand that I'm in control? Don't you understand that I'm using you as my instrument? And I'm giving you opportunity for blessing if you will but obey me? And get your attitude right. You don't even care that the 200,000 children in that city who can't tell the difference between their right hand and their left hand, and you want me to fry it. The will of God is sovereign. He gives us opportunity for obedience, and when we obey, He gives us blessing. But His will shall be done. So it's better to be on the right side of his will than on the wrong side of his will because he will take you and drag you to what he wants you to do but you won't get the blessing from it that otherwise you would have had. Ephesians 1.9 Having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. How has God made known to you the mystery of his will? You've got a copy in your hands. The mysteries of the New Testament, there are 17 of them. 
things that were not revealed in the Old Testament, but are now revealed unto the apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Do you know what those mysteries are? Do you know what the new revelation centers around? Four major areas in the New Testament that are covered in those mysteries. Do you understand the mystery of his will? We're going to learn how to do that in a few moments. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Something you should be praying for me, something you should be praying for one another, something you should be praying for yourself. I don't cease to pray for you, says Paul, and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, not merely learning the basic mechanical facts. There's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is the accumulation of facts. Wisdom is the ability to take the facts and apply the facts to real life. Knowledge, accumulation of facts. Wisdom, knowing how to apply the facts once you've learned them. A lot of people have knowledge, but they have no wisdom. I mean, there was a guy many years ago, and I don't know his name. I read about it back when I was in high school. He had incredible amounts of facts memorized. I mean, you practically quote the encyclopedia. Incredible amount of detailed information. You could ask him a question on almost any subject, and he gave you a factual answer. But he was an idiot. He didn't know how to function in life. He couldn't tie his own shoelaces. He knew all kinds of stuff. He had no ability to apply it. Biblical wisdom and biblical knowledge deal with scripture. Biblical knowledge is the accumulation of, of facts about God and his word. Biblical wisdom is the ability to apply the facts that you have accumulated about God and his word to your own personal life and to the circumstances of life that you face. A lot of us have biblical knowledge. How much of us have biblical wisdom? Paul says, that's my prayer for you. My prayer for you is to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Hebrews 13, uh, verse 21, make you perfect in every good work to do his will. What is the will of God? The good works which he hath before ordained that you should walk in them. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. Don't stop until you get to the end of that because God has before ordained the good works that you should walk in them. We all know verses 8 and 9. Remember verse 10. God's will is that you would apply his word to the works that you do in this life. 1 John 5, 14. This is a very important verse. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Too many of us try to take that promise of, you know, well, you know, I prayed a prayer and I asked God and I in fact demand, I've heard people who say, you've got to demand it from God. People, if it's contrary to his word, you're not going to get it in the first place. Number two, you can't demand things from God. You can pray his word back to him. He always keeps his word. But you must ask according to his will. How do you know what his will is? Back to step number one. If you want to know his will, if you want to have your prayer requests answered with yes answers, you have to pray according to his will. Do you understand why the will of God is so important? It's the key to your prayer life. Revelation 17, 17. Here we find the will of God being fulfilled even by those who do not want to do the will of God. Revelation 17. One of the chapters dealing with Babylon. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be 
fulfilled. Do you understand that God puts his will into the hearts of those who are in rebellion against him so that ultimately he will receive the greatest amount of glory so that they will accomplish precisely what he wants accomplished in history so that they will come under condemnation and so that he might do good to his people and fulfill his prophetic word. His own will, another little phrase. Ephesians 1.11, in whom also we have obtained, that speaking of Christ, we find in Christ, in him, in whom, uh, all the way through Ephesians chapter 1, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. He did not take counsel of us. It was the counsel that was involved with the members of the Trinity. And it was according to the purpose that they had established, which was that God would receive the greatest amount of glory. Hebrews 2.4 God also bearing them witness, that is speaking of the apostles, he's just talked about the apostles in Hebrews 2. God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with diverse miracles, and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. I hope you understand that the will of God touches every area of the Christian life. James 1.18, how about your salvation? Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Of his own will begat he us. A father begets children. That's the context. The child does not choose who his father will be. The child does not choose the point at which he will be begotten. It is the Father who begets. Of his own will begat he us by the word of truth. Now I said a few moments ago that I'm going to teach you some beginning basics on how to do your own personal Bible study. And so this is a very good topic to start with and I've brought with me one of those show and tell kind of props which we'll be looking at in just a second. There are many other places, of course, that we could look at to talk about the will of God. So if you really want to know what the Bible says about the will of God, you should get yourself one of these. As you can see, mine is pretty well worn out. I've got tape holding the binding here. The edges are all beat up. There are many pages that are dog-eared. There are some places that are marked inside of it. This is called an exhaustive concordance. There are multiple different concordances. I will tell you the best one, and I've tried to use all of them. The best one is Strong, Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. You need to learn how to use this, and you need to learn to do it. Not merely know that it's there, not merely have it on your shelf. I have been using this since I was like eight or nine years old. Not this particular copy, I've worn out some copies. This one I have beat up pretty well over about the last, I suppose, eight or nine years. But uh, I've worn out a bunch of these things. How do I come up with these topics? Where do I find all these passages that deal with the will of God? And I mean, there are a gazillion more. How do you know how to look for them? Buy yourself a Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. It was done in the 1800s by Dr. James Strong, a man who sat down, took his Bible, and went through it, and every word, he wrote it down on a little index card, and he had his Hebrew Bible or his Greek Bible next to it. And he looked and saw which word was behind it. And then he wrote that word down. And then he put them all together in alphabetical order with all the words beginning with A and then all the words beginning with B and then all the words beginning with C. And then indicated off to the right which Greek or Hebrew word it was behind it. And he stuck little numbers down there so that you could figure it out if you happen to be using his work. He has done an immense amount of work for you. The people at Berea did not have this, and yet they searched the scriptures daily whether the things that Paul taught them were so. They did not have a concordance. They did not have an online Bible. They did not have Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament words. They did not have Unger's Bible Dictionary or Haley's Bible Handbook. They did not have all the things that we have in English and which we ignore. Most of the church doesn't even know they exist and couldn't care less. People, someday I'll be gone. I'll be dead or gone. You may or may not have another pastor. 
I care about whether or not you can take the Bible and study it for yourself, not merely reading through it and occasionally observing something in its pages. Think of this as God's love letter. Do you have a passionate love for the Savior? Do you have a passionate love for the Savior? If you got a love letter, even one that was this long, from somebody you really loved here on earth, and suppose they were away at war, overseas in Afghanistan or someplace else. Suppose they had written you 500 love letters and put together they came up with something about this thick. Would you sort of glance through it when it came in the mail and toss it under the bed? Another one comes, you think, ah, I read one of those yesterday. Don't even open it. Toss it under the bed. You get one the next day and you think, oh man, I got some water on the table. I need to sop that up. And you put that letter on top of it and you soak it up. What do you do with God's love letter? Do you really want to know what he said? Do you care what he said? He has moved people throughout history to provide tools, and in the English language, we have more than any other language in the world. He has provided tools so that we might know him, so that we might really understand his love letter to us. I encourage you, get a strong, exhaustive concordance. If you look in it and look under the word will, for example, you'll see that there are hundreds and hundreds of places where will shows up. And sometimes it just says, I will do such and such. But as you go through it, you'll be able to quickly eliminate those passages. And you'll find that the word will is always, you can always tell where it's found in that little phrase. It gives you a phrase that contains the word will. And it uses just the letter W. It puts the W in italics. It slants it so that you can pick out right where in the middle of the verse it is. And it gives you enough words on each side of that little W so that you can see what that verse is about and see whether or not that's a verse you want to look up for the purpose that you happen to be studying at the moment. And then off to the right of that, you'll see lists of numbers. And some of the numbers will be regular numbers, just straight up and down. And some of the numbers will be slatty numbers. If it's a straight up and down number, you know that that's a book of the Old Testament and that is giving you where to look in the Hebrew dictionary at the back. The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, and you don't have to be able to read Hebrew, and you don't have to be able to read Greek. You will find all these numbers in the back, and you will see the Hebrew or Greek word written out in Hebrew. These are words that are written in Hebrew here, but then it has it in English right next to it, so that you can sound it out. And then it tells you, if it happens to be a compound word, for example, that it's a compound between two different other words, and it will give you the numbers for those. For example here, Eliahoreth from 410 and 279, God of Aram, Eliahoreth, an Israelite. That was the name of some guy in the Old Testament. And it tells you the two different words that it came from. Now that one may not be too important to you right now, but it might be it someday. You can find every word that's in the Bible there in Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. If it has the slanty letters, the italic letters, you'll look in the other part, the farther back part, which is the Greek part, and that'll give you the Greek word, and it'll have it spelled out in English letters, and it will tell you all the different meanings of that word in its different kinds of contexts. You will begin to understand what God is saying to you more precisely. I know it takes work. Why shouldn't it? Do you not care? Everything that is valuable takes work. We spend our time at work in this world gaining things that the world says are valuable. And you cannot take one of those things with you. Every one of those things is subject to the laws of entropy, to decay, to rust, to deterioration, to dust.
and when you die you will leave them all behind and you put all that work into it but the word of our God shall stand forever Sometimes, as you look at the word will, you will discover that that same word in the New Testament, for example, has multiple different Greek words behind it. So we have one English word, but it actually is translating two or three different Greek words. And so you'll want to contrast those passages. You'll see that one passage has a certain Greek word, another passage has a different Greek word, and you'll discover that there are different emphases or different meanings behind those words. For example, when you look those up in the index, you'll find precise meanings where some of those words will indicate a mild wish. Some indicate a possible result. Some indicate a determination that may or may not be accomplished. Some indicate a definitive, sovereign, irresistible will. If you want to know what the passage says, and I do this kind of work for you every week when I preach the sermons. And most pastors who are faithful to the word of God do the same kind of thing. But the day may come when you no longer have the freedom to worship as you do now. I think it is approaching rapidly. Will you have the ability, and I know I don't know how to use it, but I know that Strong's Exhaustive Concordance is, uh, is in electronic format too. I mean, I've seen it advertised in CBD, uh, but I have no idea how to use that. I use books. <laughs> I'm an old-fashioned book person. But some of you know how to do that. And you could look it up, and you could look it up faster than I could look it up here in the pages of this book. Someday you may not have somebody who's able to do this for you. Are you ready for that day? You know, when you begin to do this, you'll suddenly find yourself on the way to accomplishing serious Bible study. When you begin to do this, you'll be on your way to receiving the commendation that Paul gave to the believers at Berea. Acts 17, verses 10 through 12. And the brethren immediately we sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word of, with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Now listen to verse 12. Therefore many of them believed also of the honorable women which were Greeks and of the men not a few. Now of course I can spoon feed you, which I do most of the time by doing this work for you, but notice something about the Bereans here. They were commended in contrast to the Thessalonians for doing it themselves. Notice something also here out of that passage. It was not just the elders of the church that were doing it although obviously they should be doing it. It included the honorable women, which were Greeks. You know, God hasn't restricted learning to study the scripture just to those who are the big guys in the church. The New Testament doctrine of the priesthood of believers, of all believers, means that the Holy Spirit also gives insight into the scripture to saved girls and saved women so that they can also apply the scriptures to their own lives. We're running out of time. I want to talk about the will of God in application just briefly, and the next week we'll delve, delve into it in more detail. But application, once you know the will of God, the importance of application. So we've talked about the scriptures as foundational for knowing the will of God. But we must also ask another foundational question if we want to know the will of God for our lives personally. And here's the question. Does this passage apply directly to me in knowing the will of God or does it rather do one of three other things? Does it apply directly or does it do one of these three things? Number one, does it establish a principle? Most people never get fat, 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 past the first one of those. Does it apply to me directly? Does it say something so blunt that I can't miss it? Like when I was in college, it's amazing the moronic kind of stuff that comes out in college dormitories. It's a Christian college. I went to the same college, by the way, that um, his name just slips from my mind, who just passed away out in, on the West Coast, uh, to Gordon College. I was at Gordon College. He went there also. 
the moronic things like guys in the dorm arguing, the Bible doesn't say you can't smoke. Oh, come on, guys. There's no place in the Bible that says thou shalt not smoke cigarettes. And then they might say, well, it doesn't say which kind of cigarettes. There's no place in the Bible that says the, thou shalt not smoke Marlboro cigarettes. Ah, then it's okay for me to smoke Winston's. People, what we're learning to do is learning how to study the scripture. Okay, you ask that question, is there something that directly stated that applies to me that I can't get out of it? But then you ask the question, is there a principle? Then you ask the question, is there an illustration? Then you ask the question, is there a difference here between Israel and the church? It will help you solve all kinds of problems of hermeneutics, which is the science of interpretation. Theology used to be known as the queen of the sciences. Nowadays, most people don't even know what the word means. Is there a direct application? Does the passage establish some principle? Does the passage give an illustration? Does the passage show a difference between Israel and the church? Well, our time truly is up at this point, but next week I'm going to give you a passage in which you're going to have to, I hope, and I hope you're able to answer from the New Testament. Now, you know the correct answer already. The question is, can you answer it from Scripture? But we'll save that for next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and for its power. You have held each one of us accountable for learning to study your word. We've learned a way in which to do it tonight, a tool that we can use. We see how when we use that tool, it gives us clear distinctions in different ways so that we can understand passages in their contexts. And Father, I pray that you will help us to do it. It's not expensive. Everybody in this church can afford one. Everybody in this church can read. Everybody in this church has a Bible. Everybody in the church knows that it will take work, but it has eternal rewards. So, Father, I pray that you will take the word of God as we've studied it tonight, that when we know your will, we'll be ready to do it, that we won't hesitate in taking advantage of the opportunities of how to study your word so that we will know your will, that we might be ready to say, Macedonia, here I come. We commit these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen.